Hello everybody and welcome to In Depth, a new late night mini-series dedicated to answering some of the interesting questions that I receive from you. Each episode will cover one specific topic, inspired by your questions. In my previous series, The Power of Reason, I made a case for rational thinking and statistics. But I also pointed out how one should question everything and how even the so-called experts can fall prey of errors and logical fallacies. Some of you were surprised by this. So today we will look in more detail at one of the ideas I brushed upon in one of my previous videos about research findings being potentially wrong. Having said all of this, let's go. We live at a time when everybody, whatever side they're in, seem to think that they are so irrevocably right. It appears as if once you can produce some sort of data or a chart, then the thing is settled and proved. Politics, society, climate, health, nutrition. I show you a study, you show me a study. I produce some data, you produce some data. People throw science around in a paradoxically dogmatic fashion, and belief in science becomes just a way to justify authority. And this happens at every level. The public is at the mercy of, of the availability bias and other heuristics, which we have discussed in The Power of Reason. The media, irresponsibly, spews out research findings without explanation of the inherent uncertainties in a constant pursuit of sensationalism. And scientists themselves can be so absorbed in their research that they often miss the broader perspective of how science should, act should actually work. I have been a scientist myself. And let me tell you this, science is not something you believe in. Science is a system of doubt. You know from my previous videos that I like shaking your confidence in your knowledge and then build back from there. So today I will do the same. Shake your old confidence in science and hopefully build back from there a new and more constructive understanding of the purpose and validity of science. So today I will explain how most scientific studies nowadays are wrong. I will finish this with some sort of eulogy to common sense, the very common sense or intuition that I accused of as responsible for many of the logical fallacies in the 10 episodes of The Power of Reason. And yes, that's right. Common sense can be sometimes bad, sometimes good. And embracing duality doesn't mean contradicting oneself but it simply means accepting the full spectrum of knowledge with all of its possible nuances. Nothing is black or white and nothing is final. So, let's start by tackling the massive statement I just casually threw in your face. Most research findings nowadays are wrong. <laughs> I admit this is a bit of a sensationalist headline itself, but not one I use lightly. The starting point for this conversation is a paper, or an essay rather, by Stanford epidemiologist John Ioannidis, who, as early as 1999, showed mathematically how more than half the research findings out there in fields such as health and nutrition are probably wrong due to the statistical method employed by the majority of scientists. Of course, one would have to be sure that his theory itself is correct. <laughs> but we are not here to do that. His paper is of course subject to criticism as it should, and we are not taking it as a final verdict. However, it is an interesting discussion to have because it was found over time and by a variety of investigators that the results of many experiments and studies in the published literature cannot be replicated, casting doubts on their validity. In fact, only a third of 100 studies published in three top psychology journals could be successfully replicated 
This was done in a large test that was carried out by a group of researchers in 2015. <laughs> I'm thinking about Karl Popper, who is probably rubbing his hands in the grave because he considers psychology a pseudoscience, not real science. But we will get to this another time. <laughs> so let's see more in general how scientific research findings can be wrong. The first two causes of error we have already explored in the power of reason. Number one, confusing correlation with causation. I made a whole video about the difference between causation and correlation. But here is an example of wrong causation inferred from correlation. So we know that increased testicular temperature reduces sperm motility. So this is why, for example, if you're trying to conceive, you should avoid hot baths and vice versa. A hot bath can be used as a contraceptive, even if far from perfect. So don't try this at home. <laughs> but there was one urologist who published a study correlating global warming with declining male fertility and declaring that one must be the cause of the other. The correlation seems clean when you put it in a chart, but it is not at all proven that rising temperatures are the actual cause of reduced fertility, which is probably caused by other things such as poor diet, pollution, or other chemicals that men are incre increasingly exposed to. These causes must be taken into account as they are definitely more plausible than global warming. The hotter climates are definitely not slowing down fertility closer to the equator, for example. So causation versus correlation, classic mistake and the first mistake. Number two, sample size. Once again, I have a whole video which is already up about the importance of sample size. But in a nutshell, anecdotal evidence, even if it has a powerful effect on our imagination is not science. So your friend who cured her eczema with lavender or the new colon cancer treatment that cured nine people are not science. And in fact, even the study with 100 participants might not be valid. Often much larger samples are needed. The problem is that the larger the sample, the costlier the experiment. Most studies do not have this sort of budget, apart from large pharmaceutical companies, of course. And this is, in fact, this is also interesting because it could in part explain the recent prevalence of pharmaceutical therapies as opposed to alternative therapies. Alternative therapies are not proven because, well, no one will invest in testing the effect of, say, apple cider vinegar because, well, no one can monetize on something that is publicly available and not patentable. But that's beside the point. So let's move on to the third cause of wrong research findings. This is actually one of the main points in Professor Ioannidis' essay, the unreliability of the p-values in statistical inference. Now, I know you might be asking yourself, what the heck is a p-value? <laughs> so to put it very simply, in a study or experiment that relies on statistical methods, a p-value is the probability that the results observed are purely due to chance. And for some reason, it is commonly accepted that for a study to be statistically significant, the p-value has to be lower than 0 0.05, or in other words, less than 5% probability, or 1 in 20, that the results are due to chance. But there are two main issues with this. Number one is that often the data are massaged at best, dredged or even outright manipulated at worst, in order to squeeze out the desired p-value from the data. 
Let's not forget that scientists are human after all, and they have their interests, they have their egos, they have external pressures, and they have intrinsic bias. But another, potentially more insidious problem with a p-value set of 5% lies in the fact that in most cases, the only published results are the successful one. And we do not see the failed experiments in a scientific publication. And why is that bad? Well, in a complex medical field, such as, say, gene therapy, there are many potential hypotheses to be tested. If we test 20 false hypotheses with a p-value of 0.05, statistically, one of them will show as true, a false positive, though totally due to chance. And of course, this is the result that will get published. So the odds become even worse in studies that investigate small effects, for example, side effects of a treatment that you know show up only in 1% of patients. So in a world where every researcher tests multiple hypotheses and only publishes the successful ones, we are left with a high probability of these results being not replicable. And this is why nowadays many publications require scientists to submit all of the protocols and all of the raw data prior to publication in order to uh, avoid willful or unwillful manipulation of the results. The other reasons for which um, a research finding could be considered unreliable or wrong are due to the inherent quality of the study itself or its protocols and techniques. For example, the choice of placebo. The first mistake we listed today was the wrong inference of causation from a correlation. We have seen in the power of reason that the best way to get around this problem is to perform a control study in which one group receives a treatment and another group receives a placebo. This gets rid of wrong attributions of causation due to third causes or other statistical effects such as regression to the mean. But the problem we are discussing now is the actual selection of the correct placebo. One study concluded that fish oil capsules are actually not effective at preventing heart disease. This is surprising. We all know that fish oil is good for your heart. But uh, upon further inspection, we see that participants in the control group in this study were given olive oil capsules as placebo. Well, as it happens, olive oil is also good for your heart. And this is why there was no observed difference between people taking fish oil and people taking the placebo. So we can discard this study. And as far as we know, fish oil is still good for you. Other dubious results come from research on animals, such as mice or rabbits. If I give meat to a rabbit, it won't be good for it because, well, rabbits do not eat meat. I cannot conclude that meat is not good for humans simply because the rabbits in the lab developed heart disease from eating meat. Another common bias in experiments, especially experiments concerning nutrition, is the recall bias. A recent study suggested that eggs increase cardiovascular risk. Participants were asked about their diet and results were drawn. But even the best of us have trouble recalling what they had for dinner two days ago. This is why many studies have now falsified the hypothesis that eggs are linked to cardiovascular disease. So luckily for us, we can carry on eating the yolks that so many people discard thinking that it's bad for them. Measuring diet is extremely difficult. Imagine quantifying precisely what people actually eat. Even when trying to administer a diet or a supplement to a large number of people, it is difficult to make sure that the volunteers adhere to it or that they actually take the supplement regularly as prescribed. 
I'm not saying it cannot be done. I'm saying that it is hard and it requires a lot of money. Most researchers do not have that money. But there is enormous pressure to publish and to compete with other researchers, especially if a field is hot. In fact, the hotter the field, the more unreliable studies are published. They pop up like mushrooms. The problem, of course, lies also with the media trying to grab people's attention with the latest horrible study on coffee, chocolate or red wine. In a 2013 study, two researchers took the 50 most used ingredients in a popular recipe book and went on a quest to find out how many of these ingredients had previously been linked to cancer in the available literature. 40. 40 out of the 50 ingredients have been associated to cancer in at least one study, including salt, flour, parsley and sugar. The question that arises naturally is, is everything we eat carcinogenic? The answer, for once, does not rely on science, but on good old common sense. No, not everything we eat kills us. Or in fact, yes, everything we eat kills us. And that is simply because, as a species, we are designed biologically to live 30, 40 years. But with agriculture, medicine and science, we now live to be 70, 80. And this is why we, the modern people, should brush our teeth to prolong the lifespan to match our own. But sooner or later, statistically speaking, something will kill us. Some cells will go crazy and turn into a tumor. All we can do is to try and mitigate. And in this case, one of the best ways to mitigate is using common sense. If every other day a new study tells you to quit this or do more of that, how do you make sense of it all? Common sense, balance, the way your grandma would probably do it, old wisdom. How much water should I drink? People ask me, expecting me to say something scientific or something precise, 2.5 liters. But no, it is simpler than that. When you're thirsty, drink water. It worked so far. How much protein should I consume? Well, if you're eating six chicken breasts in a day and three protein shakes, you're definitely not applying common sense. And I'm sorry to say, but you're not applying science either. I am making examples linked to health and nutrition, but the issue is much broader, of course. Science-based decisions that are in turn based on unreliable data or sloppy studies affect us every day. They affect our personal choices, but also policies and courses of action taken by corporations and governments. They affect and shape public opinion. That's why you and I, the public, need to be prepared and aware about the state of our knowledge. We need to question and we need to constructively debate. Science is not authority. It is only the best we can do. In the next episodes, in fact, in the next episode, I will talk about the scientific method. Despite, despite all I said today, in its, in its entirety, science works. It does work. Science is the greatest thing humans have created. It allows us to live longer and more comfortably. It allows us to travel, to communicate, and to express ourselves creatively in a million ways. Heck, if one couldn't even make a painting without the chemistry of how colors stick together, let alone photography, cinema, music. Science allows institutions and society to function. But how many of you actually sat down and studied what science actually is? in its full breadth and power. How many of you thought, thought it worthwhile, worthwhile to understand in depth the philosophy of science? Something that has such an impact on our lives must be understood. And I think that an in-depth exploration of the scientific method will give us a kickstart in doing just that. 
So stay tuned. Thank you so much.